Hello everyone. Let's begin with the biology chapters in this series of videos with the first chapter, the fundamental unit of life. So let us first see a brief overview of what all things we'll be studying in this chapter. We will begin with the introduction part. Then we will see what are living organisms made up of. And we will look into what is a cell made up of, what is the structural organization of a cell, the, which includes plasma membrane or also known as the cell membrane, the cell wall, nucleus, cytoplasm and in the end we will look into some cell organelles and end this chapter. So let's begin with the introduction. While examining a thin slice of cork, scientist Robert Hooke saw that the cork resembled the structure of honeycomb consisting of many little compartments. Cork is a substance which comes from the bark of tree. It was in the year 1665 when Hooke made this chance observation through a self-designed microscope. So what Robert Hooke called them was cells. Cell is a Latin word which means a little room. This may seem to be a very small and insignificant incident but it is very important in history of science that discovery of cells was made. This was the very first time that someone had observed that living things appear to consist of separate units. The use of word cell to describe these units are still used in biology. So what are the living organisms made up of? To answer this question, we need to do a small activity. In this activity, we will take a small piece of onion bulb and with the help of a pair of forceps, we will peel off the skin which is also called the epidermis from the concave side which is the inner side of the onion. Now this layer can be put immediately in a watch glass containing water. We will do this because it will prevent the peel from getting folded or getting dry. Now what we will do is we will take a glass slide and put a drop of water on it and transfer a small piece of peel from the watch glass to the slide. In doing so we should make sure that the peel is perfectly flat on the slide. Now we'll put a drop of iodine solution on this piece followed by a cover slip. Now when we will see this under microscope, what we'll see is these structures look similar to each other which is shown in this picture. Together they form a big structure like an onion bulb. We find from this activity that onion bulbs of different sizes have similar small structures visible under a microscope. The cells of the onion peel will all look the same, regardless of size of the onion they come from. These small structures that we see are the basic building units of onion bulb. These structures are called the cells. Not only onions but all organisms that we observe around are made up of cells. However, there are also single cells that live on their own. A single cell may constitute a whole organism as in the case of amoeba and chlamydomonas, paramecium and bacteria. These organisms are called the unicellular organisms which means single cell organisms. On the other hand, many cells group together in a single body and assume different functions in it to form various body parts in multicellular organisms. Multi means many, such as fungi, plants and animals. Every multicellular organism has come from a single cell. Now how can we say that? Cells divide to produce cells of their own kind. All cells thus come from pre-existing cells. Some examples of cells are the smooth muscle cells, the blood cells, nerve cells, fat cells, the reproductive cells, the sperm and ovum, and the bone cell shown in this picture. The shape and size of cells are related to specific function they perform. Some cells like amoeba have changing shapes. In some cases the cell shape could be more or less fixed and peculiar for a particular type of cell. For example nerve cells that are present in our brain have a typical shape. Every living cell has the capacity to perform certain basic functions that are characteristic of all living forms. Now how does a living cell perform these basic functions? We know that 
there is a division of labor in multicellular organisms such as the human beings. This means that different parts of human being, uh, the human body, perform different functions. The human body has a heart to pump blood, has a stomach to digest food, and so on. Similarly, division of labor is also seen within a single cell in many cases. In fact, each such cell has got certain specific components within it which are known as the cell organelles. Each kind of cell organelle performs a special function, such as making new material in the cell, clearing up of waste material from the cell, and so on. A cell is able to live and perform all its functions because of these organelles. These organelles together constitute the basic unit called the cell. It is interesting that all cells are found to have the same organelles no matter what their function is or what organisms they are found in. Moving forward, what is a cell made up of? What is the structural organization of a cell? We need to answer this question. Now if we study a cell under a microscope, we would come across three features in almost every cell. These are the plasma membrane, the nucleus and the cytoplasm. All activities inside the cell and interactions of the cell with its environment are possible due to these features. Hence, these are very important for the cell to survive. The first one is the plasma membrane or the cell membrane. Plasma membrane is the outermost covering of the cell that separates the contents of the cell from its external environment. The plasma membrane allows or permits the entry and exit of some materials in and out of the cell. It also prevents movement of some other materials. The cell membrane therefore is called a selectively permeable membrane. Now how does transportation of substances take place through this cell membrane? Some substances like carbon dioxide or oxygen can move across the cell membrane by a process which is known as diffusion. Something similar to this happens in cells when, for example, some substances like CO2, which is cellular waste and requires to be excreted out of the cell, accumulates in high concentrations inside the cell. In the cell's external environment, the concentration of CO2 is low as compared to that inside the cell. Now, as soon as there is a difference of concentration of CO2 inside and outside a cell, CO2 moves out of the cell. From a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration outside the cell by the process of diffusion. So basically, there needs to be a difference in concentration for the CO2 to move out of the cell. Similarly, O2 enters the cell by the process of diffusion when the level or the concentration of O2 inside the cell decreases. Water also obeys the law of diffusion. The movement of water molecules through such a selectively permeable membrane is called osmosis. The movement of water across the plasma membrane is also affected by the amount of substance dissolved in water. Thus, osmosis is the passage of water from a region of high water concentration through a semi-permeable membrane to a region of low water concentration. Now let us look at some possibilities of what will happen if we put an animal cell or a plant cell into a solution of sugar or salt in water. The case 1. If the medium surrounding the cell has a higher water concentration than the cell, meaning that outside solution is very dilute, the cell will gain water by osmosis. Such a solution is known as the hypotonic solution. Water molecules are free to pass across the cell membrane in both directions, but more water will come into the cell than will leave. The net overall result is that water enters the cell. The cell is likely to swell up. The second case is, if the medium has exactly the same water concentration as the cell, there will be no net movement of water across the cell membrane. Such a solution is known as the isotonic solution. Water crosses the cell membrane in both the directions, but the amount of water which is going in is exactly the same as the amount of water which is going out. So, there is no overall movement of water. 
and hence the cell will stay the same size. The third case is if the medium has a lower concentration of water than the cell, which means that it is very concentrated solution. In this case, the cell will lose water by osmosis. Such a solution is known as a hypertonic solution. Again, in this case, water crosses the cell membrane in both the directions, but this time more water leaves the cell than what enters it. Therefore, the cell will shrink. Now, unicellular freshwater organisms and most plant cells tend to gain water through osmosis. Absorption of water by plant roots is also an example of osmosis. Thus, diffusion is an important in exchange of gases and water in the life of cell. In addition to this, the cell also obtains nutrition from its environment. Different molecules move in and out of the cell through a type of transport requiring the use of energy in the form of ATP, which is abbreviation for adenosine triphosphate. The plasma membrane is flexible and is made up of organic molecules called lipids and proteins. This can be observed only through an electron microscope. The flexibility of cell membrane also enables the cell to engulf in food and other materials from its external environment. Such processes are known as endocytosis. Amoeba acquires its food through such processes. A series of pictures shown here shows how amoeba acquires its food through the process of endocytosis. The second important component of cell is the cell wall. These cell walls are present in only plant cells. Plant cells, in addition to plasma membrane, have another rigid outer covering which is called the cell wall. The cell wall lies outside the plasma membrane. The plant cell wall is mainly composed of cellulose. Cellulose is a complex substance and provides structural strength to plants. When a living plant cell loses water through osmosis, there is a shrinkage or contraction of the contents of the cell away from the cell wall. This phenomena is known as plasmolysis. Cell walls permit the cells of plants, fungi and bacteria to withstand very dilute, which is the hypertonic solution, uh, external media without bursting. In such media, the cells tend to take up water by osmosis. The cell swells, building up pressure against the cell wall. The wall exerts an equal pressure against the swollen cell. Because of their walls, such cells can withstand much greater changes in the surrounding mediums than in the case of animal cells. The picture here shows a typical plant cell. The structures which are present in the cell are the cell walls. With this, we come to the end of the first video on this chapter. Thank you.